Good evening. And myself, welcome, welcome, one and all, once again, to the Milwaukee Leadership Academy. This is session seven. Uh, this is our final meeting of this year. I'm going to go ahead and start with our normal courtesy recording notice. This meeting is being recorded for later posting to the City of Milwaukee YouTube channel. Please refrain from making any private recordings of the meeting. That's all. All right. So, but we are going to. Like I said, this is the Milwaukee Leadership Academy tonight, session seven, parks development and library. But before we get into that, we're going to look at tonight's schedule. We have some housekeeping. We have our counselor interview. We have a break, uh, parks development, our library uh, session, and then also aha moments and good night. First, though, our agreements, as always, will show respect and empathy for each other and guests. We will seek to be actively involved in the class. We will allow the facilitators to be responsible for keeping the class on time and on track. And we'll seek to make Milwaukee a flourishing city that is entirely equitable, delightfully livable, and completely sustainable. And before we go on, I do just want to say thank you all for being here. This is the first time we've tried to do this in person in well over two years. And it is absolutely a delight to be in a room together doing uh, truly my favorite part of my job. So housekeeping. Um, we have events coming up. Earth Day on April 23rd, that's this coming Saturday, we have Earth Day. There are going to be so many events throughout the city. The city uh, is hosting a cleanup event uh, in the wetlands, and the name is escaping me right now, Willow but place. Willow Place, Willow Place. Uh, all of these that I'm about to mention are visible, uh, should be visible through the city calendar, through the community calendar. Uh, that's going to include also uh, Historic Milwaukee. Uh, Llewellyn is adopting a road. I know that Lake Road is doing a cleanup event in Century Park. So if you are in Milwaukee and you'd like to participate in an Earth Day event, this Saturday is a great opportunity to do that. Uh, on April 26th, the city manager, Ann Ober, who we met in the very first session of this, of this academy, is hosting an open door from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Um, Ann does these pre-pandemic, did these on a fairly regular basis. This is the first one um, since we've been back in person. Uh, it's an opportunity to drop in. You do not have to have an appointment, but if you'd like to sit down with the city manager and discuss concerns, interests, questions that you have, that morning is a great opportunity to do it. Um, also, she's, of course, always available by email and does respond to those emails. Uh, April 30th, we heard about a little bit in our last session, the prescription drug drop off and document shred. This is going to be taking place at the uh, public safety building on Harrison. Um, this is an opportunity if you do need to welcome, welcome. This is an opportunity if you do need to dispose of prescription drugs or documents that you'd like to have shredded on site. Uh, come on out there. And then May 1st, as I mentioned earlier, the Scott Park Community Open House. Uh, also that day, the return of the Milwaukee Farmers Market for 2022. The Scott Park Community Open House is going to be in, get this, Scott Park behind the library. Uh, and then the uh, Farmers Market will be in the parking lot just across the street from City Hall here. Looking way, way out into the future. Welcome. Looking way, way out into the future, and August 7th, just because this is something that's been taking up a lot of my bandwidth lately, Carefree Sunday, um, which is Milwaukee's signature open streets event. Um, we're going to be closing about five and a half miles of streets to automobile traffic on August 7th from 11 to 4. Um, there's going to be music, there are going to be activities, there are going to be vendors, so please do come out and walk, roll, however it is that, that you get through the world without uh, that internal combustion engine. More on that to follow, uh, always available on the city website. Before we move on from housekeeping, does anybody have any community events or other things for the good of the order? Stefan's got his hand up. <laughs> Music, it's coming back. Oh yeah. The Porch Fest, the last three Fridays of July. Uh, your chance to turn on here, Morgan Ferris, play multiple instruments. With Stefan. Willing <laughs> <laughs> neighborhood, look for the map, you'll find us there. Um, then Ardenwald neighborhood, Thursdays in August, Llewellyn neighborhood, Wednesdays in August, five of those uh, concerts. They're all, I think they're all booked now. So uh, now we got to get our permits in order and it'll really happen. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, you you want to watch out on that, Stefan. I know the guy who reviews them, he's pretty hard nosed. It ah. so. <laughs> uh, looks like Richard's got a question. Uh, yes, I, I understand there's something going on at the Letting Library where people are available to fix things that you can bring in. I'm not sure what the date is, um, 
What is but it? it Except other other characters. Characters. Oh. Okay. I'm not oh, sure about the city that. hall did it last year behind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's um, right. But it was the with the city. Yeah. You know, Richard, I'm not 100% sure about that, but I will make a note of that right now. And I will find out about that for you and, and circle back. Okay, yeah, I saw something in, in Facebook about it a long time ago, and, and uh, I can't find it right now. Uh, but I, I know it was taking place in Milwaukee. I'm not sure who was supporting it and that it was happening at the Letting Library. Yeah. Um, I, I will definitely find out more about that. And there is an end of course survey. So let me find out what kind of a, what kind of a fix it fair might be coming up in the area. And I can, I can circulate information about that. Or okay. I can really say that I tried, um, which, is, which is true, I will. Alrighty, um, so anything else before we, before we break? Not break, but what? All right, so shift I'm gonna gears. say, shift gears, thank you. So I'm gonna say welcome now to Council President Kathy Heisey and Councilor Lisa Beatty, who are here with us this evening. I am going to switch us over to a camera. Do we know who's going first? I think it's just sort of an open, uh, an open question format. So I, I think what we did with Ann and the mayor was that we asked the question and they um, sort of took it from, from there. So Stefan, if you would, uh, I, I, have, you. I have a great question to start with city councilors. Yeah, please. What would possess you to want to be a city councilor? <laughs> and that hard work, uh, first of all, how many pages were in your packet for last night's meeting? 700, 800? No, it was, it was 463 for the regular session. <laughs> oh, wow. Well. And then the holdovers. Oh, the the work session oh the, my point is, you get it. Yeah. Huge amount of work. You don't get paid. And, and people gripe incessantly at you. So why do you do it? I, that's probably why they do it. <laughs> well, where, where else can you get that? Um, I love doing it, to be honest. Even though, yeah, it's, it's a lot of work. It's, uh, a burden. I, one of the questions that I guess I was told to prepare for was why did I do it in the first place? Like how did I decide to do it? I was involved with my neighborhood association when I first came into the city and I was later on the utility board and I was later on the planning commission and um, I decided I saw some former counselors treat some staff pretty poorly and blame them for things that, you know, accuse them basically of, you know, somehow mis malfeasance. And that really angered me because um, I knew those staff were doing their best job. And that kind of motivated me. I mean, I had thought about running before that, but that really motivated me to run at that time. Um, yeah. That's a great answer. So I should have said this probably, but Lisa was on the planning commission for eight years? Nine years. Nine years before being on the council for this year. Eight. Eight years. Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a commitment. <laughs> Kathy? I think it's just the possibilities that I started to understand um, came with the responsibility. Um, you know, my path onto council was I. Uh, I was in the city for a couple of years and I kept seeing all of these notices come out about apply for a committee. And I moved from Portland, which is this huge faceless entity. And I had tried to be involved in the neighborhood association. I'd done work with community gardens. I'd done volunteer work with Metro, um, but I never really felt a connection to my community other than, you know, knowing my neighbors and that kind of thing. So, I was sort of noticing that there seemed to be a lot coming out of the city, and that was really interesting to me, but I just didn't, you know. And then, then the Climate Action Plan Committee uh, posting went up, and I went, I, okay, I gotta, I gotta stop just looking at these and actually throw my hat in the ring and see what happens. And I was selected as just a resident representative to that committee. And in that experience, like, I got exposed to the depth and breadth of excitement and engagement and um, seriousness 
that everyone really took the work with, um, I felt like I got to have a real voice in the process. Um, I learned things. I sat at tables with important people um, and I was just another person. Um, so it was really empowering to be a part of that process and go, oh, this is what local government is about. This is like, it's about me, it's about you, and it's just people showing up together to, to do the things that they want to do. And, and if we sit down and work together, we accomplish so much more. And I think that's been one of the strengths of this council is that, you know, and I, I do, um, I serve on committees sort of throughout the region as well. So not just here in my, in my current role. Um, so I see how other city councils work and, and they, they, don't all get, they don't all get along like we do. Um, and I think that the part where we have by and large been really pointed in the same direction has meant that we have been able to, to move Milwaukee in ways that, uh, that are just really exciting and, and not everyone's excited about those changes, but, um, you know, I talk to people who've lived in the region for 40 years and, and they say, oh yeah, Milwaukee's always, it's always had so much promise, but no one's ever really made it happen. And, and it's happening now. So it's really exciting to just kind of be a part of that and to, to feel like that opportunity is there. So that's, I think the thing that got me hooked. Um, and when I, first decided to run for council, I was asked, was asked to run. It had not occurred to me. I had no idea that anyone thought that that was something I could do. Um, and I said, uh, and it was the mayor who asked me and I said, let me, let me think about it. <laughs> and I went home and talked to my husband about it and spent the weekend thinking about it. And I said, okay, I'm gonna try this. I had no idea what I was doing. I had no idea what I was getting into. So that's the other part of it is, yeah. if you just don't know what you're getting into, it's a lot easier to go ahead and run <laughs> <laughs> I think that's true. Okay, yeah. any, those are good, great start. Anybody, does that lead to questions in anybody's mind? Go ahead. It was sort of a simple question, but what was the, like, the process of running for the seat? What did, what did that feel like? What, was that intimidating? I don't know. I'm curious about that part. I mean, obviously there's the work of the job itself, but what about the process of getting the job? Well, so you were unopposed? You were unopposed. I was unopposed, yeah. So that makes it easier. <laughs> <laughs> it's really bad when you lose them. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I guess I have more uh, yeah, experience with, you know, sort of throwing in when you are going to be opposing someone. Um, the, the process, the, the actual process of registering is quite easy. It happens in August before the November election, and there's like a 30 day or 20 day period that's open and you come in and you talk to the recorder and you get a, a petition of sorts and you have to get 20 signatures and you really want to get you know, 30 signatures to make sure because you usually are going to get some people who don't actually live in Milwaukee. They think they live in Milwaukee if they live in Oak Grove or whatever. Right? Um, and so the actual mechanics of getting on to the ballot are pretty simple. And then the state, uh, the county uh, clerk's office helps you with like how, what's the deadline to get on to the voter's pamphlet and what are the rules about what you can say in the voter's pamphlet, how many words you can so those mechanics are fairly simple. Um, I ran against an incumbent um, and another counselor who's now our state representative, Karen Power, she also was running against an incumbent that election. Um, we both, oh no, that's not true. She was running, but she was running in a, in a contested race. Um, it, you know, Milwaukee is not Portland. We're not buying TV ads. Right? You know? <laughs> um, we're not spending a lot of money. I raised about five thousand dollars to buy lawn signs and to do a mailer. Um, and uh, and that might cost a little more today than it cost eight years ago. But um, you know, that's still kind of a ballpark, I think. Um, yeah. And there were um, 
some public, uh, like, you know, candidates forums where you're, yeah. you're appearing and you're, they didn't really do them in true debate format. They were just sort of candidates forums where like a journalist would ask you all, everyone in the room, a bunch of questions. They don't, those are, have been fewer and far, farther between the last several years. And I guess that's part of the fact that newspapers have been, you know, kind of dying. So, but um, I did, I'm not sure, Greg was the one who did the, the MC, I don't remember who actually put it on, but there was the online one for the election two years ago, where they did a, a candidates forum for Desi's seat. And who did it? The, I don't remember. Did Clackamas Review do it? No, no, it was it was a homegrown. Okay. Because it used to be the historic Milwaukee neighborhood did them. Right. And maybe and, it was his and, Yeah, they used to do them and they'd have them either like at the high school or you know different places they had them. I think they had one over here in the in the uh, basin. So, yeah, and you're right, Greg Chamoff was sometimes the moderator. Um, but then in the last few years, I mean, the last time I ran, when I ran for re-election, there was just one. It was put on by the Clackamas Review. It was down in the Milwaukee Elks Lodge, and it was you know not very well attended. And the other thing is. Uh, the city manager is available, and I think she, when when we know there's going to be a number of candidates, I think she'll often do a like a formal training where all of the candidates are invited, and so she'll just kind of do an overview and orientation for for folks who are thinking about running and who are running. So, and she's always happy to talk to people about that. You know, and that is kind of running. what you've had, really. Yeah. I mean, that is like, what are the different departments, like for a candidate, you know, what are the different departments, what are they doing? So it's a lot of you know, what you've had. Surprise, we tricked you. They're <laughs> <laughs> all on the city council. <laughs> Here's your 400 page packet. <laughs> so, um, 6.15, we supposed to shift gears? Uh, no, 6, uh, 6.35. All know, right, so we've got sure. a bit more time. So, okay, any other questions before I just start throwing them out there? Yes, he will. <laughs> I'll go, I'll go. Uh, this is Rich, uh, the you know, one who's not there, sees people who aren't there. Uh, one, one of the reading articles that we had was about the two different kinds of ways of, of looking at things and, and approaching people. Um, Milwaukee, seems to have clearly taken one approach <laughs> as opposed to the other. Um, I, uh, I know I've served in, in, in elected office and I, I found that, that uh, people think of government somewhat the same way they think of church, uh, which is don't ask me to do it. <laughs> That's your job. <laughs> um, and uh, inviting people to take part in government always got the reaction of, no, that's what you do. <laughs> uh, it, it, it always worked better going out to the community and being a part of the community uh, and representing government than trying to get the community to be government. Just, you can comment on that. Uh, if if I if I could just jump in for the for the counselors, the the article that Richard is referencing talks about two different ways of that people can look at government. One of those is as a kind of a vending machine model. I pay my tax dollars. The government provides services. The other one is a kind of a barn raising model. We're all in this together, and we all we all contribute as part of this shared experience, part of this shared experiment in self governance. Um, it just for some background there. Somewhere along the line, it changed. Yeah, and Milwaukee <laughs> embraced something that that probably before I got here, uh, I've only been around for like three and a half years. Um, but just some some commentary on how you've experienced that way of being government. I mean, I think that the, the vending machine model is um, is is what you experience oftentimes in larger cities, or if you are um, if you're a busy person, 
you know, you don't have if you if you don't have the bandwidth to or don't feel like you have the bandwidth to engage with your community, then it's much easier to just say, well, I pay my taxes, things happen, I don't care. Um, and to me, you know, I noticed the first week we moved to Milwaukee six and a half years ago that when I walked down the street, people said hello to me, people engaged me. Um, it just felt really different. And I moved a mile and a half, okay? <laughs> it shouldn't have been that big a deal. Um, but that is, I think, a reflection in part of having that more community based model. And we don't do it perfectly because we're a small city. You've got to, at some point, make some decisions. You can't have every, I'm also a Quaker, so I come from a background where, where you do everything, and I mean everything, by consensus for every decision. And I, and I think there are limits to that. Um, 21,000 people all sitting down to make every single decision probably is not workable. Um, but as much of that as we can get in there, and at least getting a sense of, of what, people's, um, what people's values are. And I think that the visioning process we did um, really highlighted. These are, these are the things we hope to see, and this is more importantly how we want to get there. Um, and, and I think that empowers those of us who are elected to try and serve everyone better. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's got to continue to be that give and take over time, I think. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know that I have much to add to that. I mean, I think there will always be the people who, who only want the, the vending machine model. They, you know, even if they have time, they just, that's what they want. They, they're not that interested. I do think what makes Milwaukee special is that we have so many people who came out for town hall meetings for the yeah. visioning process, who came out for, you know, when we had a big event on on Milwaukee Bay Park to talk about what you want to see in Milwaukee Bay Park. Um, it's great that we have so many people who really want to engage. And um, I think the, um, you know, the last two years have been so tough because of not being able to meet. Um, it has given us a, and I'm so I'm a big advocate for let's have as many meetings as we can now that we can be in person, especially now that the weather, you know, we're getting into the time of year when weather's good and we can meet outside if people are concerned. Um, but uh, it also has given us these tools to allow people to participate for who have childcare issues or whatever issues that keep them from being able to come to you know evening meetings. So. You know, it's given us some good tools, even though it's been a hard couple of years. Um, it's been a way to let some new people who didn't engage before engage. So I want to I want to answer this question too. Okay. Um, because I worked in local government for forty five years, and I, I said it at the time. I all those years worked in Corvallis and Canby and Wilsonville and Lake Oswego and Milwaukee. All those years, I never saw the kind of turnout that we had in those open houses here for uh, the vision process, the climate smart process, uh, comp plan revisions, uh, housing stuff. Other, it, you know, when the word got out to people, they would fill the auditorium and uh, and had opinions and took an active part. And there were Spanish language translators, and there were helpers of all kinds, and childcare. And, I'm just saying that that was a real awakening for me after all those years doing it professionally and thinking, why can't we get people more involved in this? And um, and I, I think it's and one reason why I point it out now is because so many of the people in this room and Richard out there in video land are all fairly new to the area. And so a lot of people weren't here when all of that was going on, even though it was just a few years ago. Um, and then the important part of that is as the city council moves forward, not uh, the city council moved forward in some huge ways last night. And as it continues to do that, being able to say, we're doing this because of things that were put in motion five years ago, three years ago, two years ago. Mm -hmm. And it's not just something you made up last week, you know. But, oh, let's see what we can do to people out there. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> this will stir them up. <laughs> anyway. But there will always be someone out there oh, who absolutely. posts on Facebook that they just did this to stir us up. <laughs> or, or, and the one that I got every single time, every one of those processes is, we weren't told. This was all done in secret. It's like, where were you? You know, <laughs> We were trying to talk to you. What, what do you get when the people that, uh, that say, you know, I moved here 40 years ago because I loved it and I don't want it to change. Yeah. Not recognizing that it changed. Yeah, what do you change say to is them? constant. Change is, change is always happening. And the change that's happening now is land values and housing prices are skyrocketing. Yeah. And that change is invisible to people who moved here 40 years ago because they paid their mortgages. Yeah. Yeah. They don't see it unless they've got kids who are trying to move nearby and then, then they start to understand. So I get where it comes from. I, I'm sympathetic, but um, but the change is real. The change is already happening. It's well, and I, I was going to say when I, I in you know I moved here in 2002. I just I'm just hitting 20 years in my home here, and um, in the late 2000s was when the or mid to late 2000s was when all the big debate was going on about the orange line and bringing a light rail. And that was really where you saw old Milwaukee yeah. versus new Milwaukee. And you saw the people who, and even, you know, some, some great neighborhood leaders who were, you know, longtime residents, but who were really excited about light rail, who said, you know, you don't put up a picket fence around the town. You know, yeah. this is part of change. This is part of, you know, but it was, it was very divisive. Mm -hmm. Period in Milwaukee. Um, that's and crazy. So controversial maybe. that a mayor got recalled though. Yes, yes. For his yes. support of light rail. Wow. That's amazing to me that it was that long ago because I've only lived here for three years. And when I moved here and got signed up on next door, it still gets commented about all the time. People, everything is because of the light rail. Like everything that's wrong is because of the light rail. And the police have There's completely so many comments oh. about that. Yeah. It's yeah. Not, I mean, our crime rates did not change. <laughs> with light rail. With light yeah. rail. So crazy. I can't believe it was almost 20 years ago that that debate was happening right. and people are still that mad about it. Well, the line opened in 2015, yeah. but of course building something like that takes right. a lot of time. So it was really about 2007, 2008, at the 2009 that the decisions were made about the alignment. I was on the planning commission then, um, that the decisions were made about the alignment and where, you know, with how it was gonna come through and mm -hmm. all of that was, yeah, that time period. And there were people who were, you know, Try and there was a very divided council. I mean, a lot of those votes were three two um, at the time. Uh, there was a very divided council, and there were a lot of people very um, emotional on both sides of the issue. Yeah. What do you do? You see any other issue on the horizon that has that kind of level of volatility or? Divisiveness. You know, we've got a lot of regional planning issues that are are coming up through the state. Mm -hmm. The what Stefan was referring last night, we voted on um, zoning and parking and tree code. Tree code is not part of responding to the the state level stuff, but the other two are. We've got another set of um, state level planning issues land use issues coming down around the, um, the governor's orders on climate change. Mm -hmm. And those are being maybe getting shook out in May. Um, and then probably in December, they'll start going into effect January. Um, so yes and no, because there's, and Lisa may have a different answer here, but, but um, there are things that people are angry about. Mm -hmm. Uh, or, you know, the 205 bridge mm -hmm. and regional tolling. tolling. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Those are all big issues that, that we are really, we're making nuances, we're applying nuances to them at the city level, but really they're state level decisions that are kind of happening in the region. Um, 
tolling is hugely, well, I don't know if it's divisive so much as just most people don't want it. <laughs> um, but the legislature has put it into place. The Oregon Transportation Commission has put it into place. Milwaukee is not going right. to stop or start tolling. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, so I think the I, other, I mean, I think all those housing issues will percolate up as we see development happen. I don't think they're going to be divisive, like sort of, I mean, there will, they will be potentially problems in certain blocks or certain areas where people don't like what's happening. But I don't think they're going to be sort of citywide divisive things, um, or at least I don't see that scale coming. I think the the one thing looming out there is if we start having the houseless living on the street the way they are in Portland, mm -hmm. and the you know the lack of cleanliness and the abandoned RVs and all those kind of things, I could see that being. Uh, a pretty divisive issue. Why don't you, I mean, if, maybe this would just be an educated guess, but why don't we see that here? Like, why is it that that's such a Portland problem and not, because obviously they can't. I think our them. police are pretty proactive about trying to help people find shelter, Okay, for one thing. Um, that's the culture that they've had. We've had officers who are, you know, sort of assigned that <coughs> task uh -huh. for the last 10 years anyway. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think that's part of it. Um, neighbors are very proactive about calling it in when they <laughs> see it too. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's sort of a, you know, let's knock wood and yeah. there but the grace of God go I, you know, I mean, you know, you can't say it won't happen. You know? Well, and I think that it's also like there's a there's a host. Of course, it's a complex issue, right? Right. Portland Police Bureau can't keep officers to save its life. So our ratio of officers to residents is is actually higher than it is in Portland. Um, and not that it's only police officers who who should or are um, dealing with houseless populations at all, but but they're often the first line. Um, we're also working pretty closely with the county to, to just try and get services here that we know those houseless folks need. Um, and, you know, our volunteer of the year was, was, I always get it backwards, Love One? Did I get it right? Okay. Which is a nonprofit started by folks who live here in Milwaukee who started by providing laundry services for free at certain, you know, a couple times a month. And it's just grown and grown into providing more and more services, food, hygiene. They have a shower truck that they bring to sites now. Um, they do really cool work. So I think some of it is also that you have, it's again, that, that smaller scale. People feel like they can make a difference. And so they, they do. They step up and they do these things, um, but it is all guesswork. I, I I don't have a clear answer for that. I think also just because Portland is the big city, that's where you see people just land for whatever reason. Um, you you don't see uh, as and some of it is seen to be very clear, right? Right. Um, yeah. But you don't see houseless folks outside of really urban areas nearly as much. So. Yeah. We're coming. Maybe down. next year we should invite a homeless, houseless person, or two, or formerly houseless person, whatever, to take part in one of our sessions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and reach out to, uh, to Northwest Housing. I mean, they have great. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. yeah they're right here. Right on the edge of our down there. Yeah. and love one. I mean, Brandy and Tom. I'm sure come and talk to us. We're we're coming right down to time. Um, I wonder. If, if there are any sort of parting thoughts on on this on this notion of of, of public service public involvement um, just just I, I think I think both of you have touched on it in in your answers but but what what, is, what does it mean to be involved in a city like Milwaukee what does it mean for somebody who maybe isn't uh, elected maybe somebody who's 
I don't know, sitting in a class, hypothetically, put on by the city once a month for <laughs> seven months. That would never happen. Yeah, well, I mean, what, what, would, what would you say to a hypothetical person like that if there was a room full of them? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would put in a pitch for getting involved in your neighborhood association. And I know that sometimes the neighborhood association may not feel that welcoming, you may, or you may feel like you went there and it's the same old people and they're always grousing about the same old things. Um, I think if you pair up with a friend, a neighbor, a like-minded person and go together to your neighborhood association, you would be amazed at what two people in a neighborhood association can do. Because most of the neighborhood associations, the people who have chaired them have you know, they're, they're in the chair again this year because no one else would step, step up to be the chair. Yes. <laughs> and I, I mean, I did that for years. I was the chair and then I like switched with somebody and they were the chair and I was the secretary, you know, it was like the same little team of people. So um, they could use new blood and you, it's your way to get in and see your immediate piece of Milwaukee and get involved and like Stefan said, you know, some of them have concert series, some of them do community gardening, some of them do, you know, just different things and they're really a, they have, they get $4,000 a year from the city, uh, each neighborhood association to spend on projects, so they have some seed money for if there's some pet project, there's some corner in your neighborhood that you think needs to be beautified or, you know, you want to buy a weed whacker and like clean a bunch of ivy up or, you know, whatever. Um, uh, that's a great way to both meet neighbors and, and sort of, you know, get involved in Milwaukee as a first step. As an ivy puller, I have to say, I don't think a weed whacker is the right tool. Okay. <laughs> 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 Yeah, I do think the, the neighborhood associations are a good place to do that. And if you walk in and they're talking about a bunch of stuff you don't care about, like Lisa said, get two of your friends and show up at the next meeting and talk about the thing you do care about. And they will be so excited that there's someone who's there talking about anything that they will just go, oh, yeah. that's a great idea and run with it. Um, because there is a lot of stagnation that just happens and it's good people who step up and then they get stuck there <laughs> um, so that's a great idea but really just showing up anywhere and you've all shown up here and i thank you for that because this is especially during a pandemic trying to stick with doing something on zoom every month um, it shows that you really do care and i i really appreciate you taking the time to learn about things that people think are boring and unimportant. Because um, now hopefully you know that that's not true. And hopefully you see how um, how you have a perspective that is helpful and worth, worth sharing and putting out there. And don't forget that we do have our boards and committees open. I'm sure Dan and Stefan have both <laughs> been mentioning that on the regular, but we would love to see you and interviews. <laughs> so, so, so. Are you going to stick around or are you going to take off? You. I'm it's your call. Gonna, I'm going to fold because I had a migraine last night. No. I'm, this is as much thinking as I can do for the <laughs> right. uh, yeah. I'm going to stick around. This. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Well, with that, folks, we're going to go ahead and pause recording for right now. And Hey, welcome back, everybody. Thanks so much for uh, joining us again after that break. We are joined now by Adam Moore. Um, who is here to talk to us about parks development. And Adam, I'm so sorry, I don't have your title written down here in front of me. Would you uh, maybe start start with that? Yeah, can you guys hear me all right? We can. Yeah, yeah so I'm Adam Moore. I'm the parks development coordinator here at the city of Milwaukee and uh, was hired by the city about six months ago to work to develop Scott Park, Bowman Bray Park and Belfour Park. Great, thank you very much. Um, please go go ahead on in, and if we do have questions in the in the room, we'll uh, we'll give you a shout. Sure. Or, would um, you prefer that folks wait until the end to ask? Yeah, I've got uh, I've got some pretty dense slides here. I'm gonna apologize ahead of time uh, for those. I promise I do like uh, pictures. In fact, it's actually my job to work with all of you to create 
some pretty pictures over the next year for our parks and then work to build those. Uh, but I put together this presentation pretty quickly. So uh, you all are gonna get a lot of, lot of text here. Uh, thankfully, I'm not in the room, so I have no idea what it looks like. <laughs> Perfect. All right. All right. So uh, as I mentioned, I'm Adam Moore. I'm here to help build uh, Bowman Bray, Belfour, and Scott Park. But sometimes uh, in certain rooms, maybe not with all of you, because you all seem like very thoughtful people, we often have to justify why we want to spend our public dollars on parks. And that's because parks have lots of power. Right? We know that parks have economic power. Uh, a thriving, well-designed, thought-out park uh, brings in new residents, new businesses, and new investments. We know that uh, quality parks help to stabilize our neighborhoods and increase property values. We know that parks have health power. So uh, access to parks, particularly in walking distance in our neighborhoods, helps to increase um, exercise uh, in that neighborhood up to 25% more, which can reduce uh, uh, heart disease in the population quite a bit. Uh, as we've all seen in the past two years, parks can provide social distancing. In fact, a lot of the work that I'm doing here at the city is paid for with COVID stimulus dollars. And that is because we recognize that in some of our neighborhoods, we don't have quality outdoor gathering space or quality outdoor gathering space with shelters. And so we need to build some of those pavilions and get, get going on some of those parks. Uh, we also know that just spending as little as 10 minutes in parks or woodland areas can have tangible uh, reductions in our stress levels. There's actually some really cool uh, research that's being done by the city of Philadelphia, and they found that just having a street tree by a bus stop makes it feel like the bus comes a lot quicker because your stress levels are reduced to a point that it seems like the bus is running on schedule or, or, or beyond schedule. Most importantly to me, I feel like parks have community power. Um, parks are one of those last great public spaces where everybody um, gets involved. And so our parks can really tie a community together and bring diverse populations, people from all walks of life to our parks. And these are key and sometimes often the only available uh, sources of recreation and uh, social opportunities for at-risk youth and low-income families, right? That is often their first choice, sometimes their only choice. And of course, we're talking about parks, we're talking about trees. Um, so, you know, parks do have that environmental pro uh, power. Now here in Milwaukee and the Pacific Northwest, we seem to know this a lot, but, you know, it does need to be said that a single acre of trees can re um, absorb the amount of CO2 of driving your car 11,000 miles. And on average, a single tree can manage up to 100 gallons of rainwater, which here in, in uh, the Portland area, uh, that's pretty important. So what are the steps of developing a park? Um, first and foremost, you need money, right? And often that money comes in the form of grants. These grants can come from all sorts of different levels of government. And it can also come from like nonprofit organizations uh, or private foundations like the Milwaukee Parks Foundation. And sometimes they also require partnership. So we'll work together either with private entities or other forms of government in order to get that money and spend it. One of the ways that we often uh, pay for parks is we have what's called a service development charge. Uh, now, what the heck does that mean? So if you think about parks as a service, right, we have a certain number of park acres per person. Well, when a developer comes along and builds a new neighborhood or a new house or a new apartment complex, Right, the amount of people goes up, but the parks stay the same. And so now we have less parks per person and we can charge that developer a fee so that we can build new parks or build new playgrounds to build that service level back up to everybody. And of course we have you know, just our everyday local taxes that we can also use for parks. <clears throat> Once we have our money, we have to figure out what the heck we're gonna do with it. Um, and that means that we are going to work with the uh, public, and I was so happy to hear that our city councilors did not mention that uh, what the heck do we do with Scott Park as a divisive issue that might be coming up. Uh, I'm going to hold you guys to that. Um, but we work together with the public and we do engagement to decide what to do at that property. That process can be different depending on which location we're working at. Um, this type of planning is required not only at the property level, so like what do we do with Scott Park, but also what do we do about parks in the city or maybe parks in the region? So we are a member of North Clackamas Parks and Rec District. And so they do master planning 
And here at the city, we do comprehensive planning, and that helps us decide what we're going to be doing with our tax dollars in the form of capital improvement plans uh, at a wide scale. And then people like me work with all of you to make plans on an individual process. Um, that engagement process can be led by steering committees. We will host public meetings and workshops, and we'll get improve, um, approval from public bodies like the Planning Commission and City Council. Now, you're going to work with planners like me to help uh, come up with some pretty pictures, and then we're going to work on turning those pretty pictures into designs. We're going to refine those down to construction documents, and then we're going to work with those public bodies to make sure that we hit all of our land use permits, our building permits, and everything else to make sure that they're feeding, uh, fitting our code and they're not going to fall down on top of our heads. Now, construction is often the last part of the development process, but it's something that we're actually thinking about through every single step. Right? We want to make sure that we have enough money to build with whatever we come up with when we're deciding on what to build and what to design when we're making our planning process. We're thinking about the construction costs so that we aren't promising all of you or hoping making you think that we're going to be able to afford a Porsche when often all we can afford is a Cadillac or maybe something else. So it's really that construction piece and the cost of construction is something that we're thinking about right now. So what does that mean for all of you here in Milwaukee? So the funding that we have on this project mostly comes from the American Recovery Plan Act. That's COVID stimulus dollars that uh, came from the federal government and went to the state. And then our uh, local legislature to help us uh, secure $2.25 million of that. Uh, we also may be using um, anywhere up to $317,000 of Metro local share dollars. Um, those are bonds that are available to the city of Milwaukee, but we have to work with Metro to make sure that we're applying those grants accurately. And then we have about $60,000 of city general fund. All this funding has different rules associated with it. So it's actually very helpful to have multiple pots because as you can maybe imagine, trying to buy a piece of property with federal dollars is a lot harder than maybe buying a piece of property with just city of Milwaukee dollars. So the planning and engagement for this process, we've thought very carefully about. Uh, but the end goal is to create a new master plan for Scott Park and then refine the existing 2015 plans for Belfour and Bowman Bray Parks. In this process, we have an emphasis on building the community and bringing new voices into the process. So that can be new residents like all of you, but we're really going to be focused on trying to ensure that we've invited and work with Black, Indigenous, and people of color uh, or our BIPOC community so that we can make sure that, uh, that they are, are involved in the process where often they've been left out of. Our design and permitting, right? We're gonna bring those pretty pictures to city council, those conceptual plans um, and ask them to approve them. And then we're gonna work with the planning commission to make sure that we get all of our permits and that everything we build is safe and good for the environment as well. For this project, we expect construction will start in the fall of 2023 and be completed in the fall of 2024. So how do we do all that? How do we make these parks happen by October, 2024? We do that by uh, often hiring a development team, right? Cities often don't have the staff on hand to um, make these big projects happen. So we're gonna you know, often hire planning, outreach, communication, and engagement managers. Those are people that help ensure that the public space has a public plan, right? We talked a lot uh, earlier about public servants Right? We want to make sure that we are being good public servants to all of you, and we really do want to hear from all of you. Right, And our jobs as planners and as outreach managers is to make sure that we're effectively communicating with all of you, that we're understanding your wants and needs, and that we're keeping you involved. Also, we want to make sure that we give you opportunities to hold us accountable for the requirements of our grant and that we're meeting our, our goals uh, as a city. It's also our job to facilitate conversations, right? It's not my job to run the conversation. I wanna make sure that the conversation happens. I wanna give you opportunities to spark imagination. I wanna manage your expectations through, through research and making sure you understand what's feasible beforehand, okay? So again, like we talked, uh, as I mentioned before, you know, sometimes people always want that Porsche, but we can only afford a Cadillac. Or in other cases, maybe a Prius is way more effective and better for us in what we're doing. Um, then we're going to hire landscape architects, designers, and structural architects. Those are the people that are going to take the wants and needs and dreams of all of us and help turn those into illustrations. 
Those illustrations will then get turned into technical, technical documents like designs and construction. Um, those are what the planning commission and are gonna look at to, to ensure that we're meeting all of our goals and it's not gonna fall on our head. Uh, a big part of making sure things aren't gonna fall on our head is not just working with architects, but also with engineers. So they're working to ensure our safety and compliance. They're making sure that everything that we dream up is physically possible and is uh, gonna stay where we put it for as long as we want. Uh, very often, these teams can include lots of different types of specialists. So over the course of my career, we've worked with, I've worked with hydrologists, arborists, horticulturalists, anthropologists. So for example, if you're in construction process and you come along um, some artifacts underground, right? You bring in your anthropologist to make sure those are treated properly. Um, I've even worked with applied geologists to do lots of different studies in our planning process to make sure that we're building the right thing at the right spot and that we're not, um, <clears throat> we're not giving any sort of advantage in the number of resources that we have to any one different type of group, right? That we've got things spread out and that we're not only building parks in affluent neighborhoods or uh, neighborhoods of one certain demographic, that we've got that spread out. Uh, a very important part of, of any sort of project is working with your construction estimators and your managers early on in the process. Again, to make sure that you're not leading to unrealistic expectations and that you're able to build everything that it is that you design. So again, what does that mean for us uh, locally? Our, I'm sorry, uh, how do we hire those consultants? Well, we go through a very complicated public procurement process. These are complicated because we wanna protect your public dollars. We also want to make sure that we get the most qualified team and that we hire people who are the best fit for our project. We do this through a process called an RFQ, a request for proposals, right? We tell everybody what they want or what we want, and they demonstrate to us that they have that expertise and that they can then propose solutions to our wants and needs. We take all those proposals and we put together a team of professionals, public staff, and city staff, and then evaluate them based on a scoring system. We then enter into the contract once we have decided who is the best fit for us and the most qualified. Now, you might notice that we're not talking about the fees or the contract at the start of the process. We're doing it at the end of the process. And that's because we want to make sure that we're making our selection based on qualifications and not cost, right? You get what you pay for, particularly in the architecture, landscape design, and engineering process, and definitely in the construction process. And so we want to make sure that we're hiring the best person, not the cheapest person. So locally, what we ended up doing is we put together an RFQ that was based on six different criteria over 100 different points. We asked the different uh, consultants and we invited everyone to participate, put an ad in the newspaper, called up like 20 different firms and said, hey, did you know this was out here? Do you want to put in a, a proposal? And we asked them to describe their overall experience and qualifications. We asked them their different methods and approach to meet our goals. We were specifically looking for experience in equity, diversity, uh, and different community outreach strategies. Uh, we've heard a lot about nature play and inclusive play. We also wanna make sure that anything that we're building play-wise is safe. We also know that we have natural resources, habitat restoration and aquatic habitat that we might want to um, work with, particularly at Scott Park and those duck ponds that exist. Um, down behind the library. And for the first time uh, at the city, we um, have been the guinea pig on, on this project for a few things. And one of the ones that we were was for ensuring that we gave points for hiring minority owned, women owned or emerging small businesses. And we did that by giving points, either five points for lead consultants or three points for sub consultants. <clears throat> um, our response, we ended up getting four submissions. They were led by Lango Hansen. Adam, are you there with us? Oh, he froze. Froze up. Yeah. And hired. Um, the review hey, team. Adam. Yep. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, you you froze after Lango Hansen. Oh, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so we also had uh, Place Architects, Two Ink Studios, uh, Greenworks, and then 17 of the 24 sub consultants of those four teams. Those were minority women owned or emerging small businesses certified. Uh, we put together a review team that was made up of six people from the city across all sorts of different divisions. Uh, we had representation from North Clackamas Parks and Rec, 
And then we had one member from the uh, Parks and Rec Board help us score all of those four proposals against those different criteria that I shared with you on the last slide. And so when we totaled up all the scores and averaged them out, Greenworks was the winner, um, deemed the most qualified and the best fit for our needs. Uh, and we then began to enter into a contract with them, which we wrapped up in February of this year. So we've actually only been working with the consulting team for about two and a half months now. Just to take a look at the um, timeline where we're at. So back in the fall of 2022, I was hired by the city. I'm going to release that RFQ that I talked about. Um, this last winter, we entered into our grant agreement with the state and the federal government. We hired our consulting team and we had what we called our place-based engagement workshop, which I will, uh, our equity-based engagement workshop, excuse me, that I'll talk about in a second. Uh, here in the spring, we're working to finalize our public involvement plan. We've got a really great event coming up in 11 days at Scott Park on Sunday, May 1st, which I'll talk a little bit about. And then um, in the next week or so, we're going to uh, really make our website look a lot prettier and get Engage Milwaukee going. Then this summer, we're going to start doing engagement for Bowman Bray and Belfort Parks, and we're going to continue on with our engagement in Scott Park. That's going to lead us all the way through uh, the fall, where we're going to present our final plans to all of you in November, and then to City Council in December. We'll work through our design and our permitting process through the winter and summer of 2023, and hope to start construction in the fall of 2023, and then be finished and cut the ribbons and have a whole lot of fun in the fall of 2024. So I mentioned our public involvement plan and you know the public engagement process for this project is very short. Uh, we have very, very tight grant deadlines, but it's really important for us that we work with all of you and make sure that people have as many opportunities and understand those opportunities to work with us along the way. So we've been working with members of the equity steering committee and the parks and rec board to help define the project goals, inform us at the city what the different strategies for including those new voices are and then identify the barriers and then uh, suggest solutions to overcome the obstacles for bringing in those new people into the conversation. Um, that's then led to this public involvement plan, which will be a public document. Um, we, we have a draft now, and we're gonna present that to the full board uh, for, of PARD and, and ESC, Equity Steering Committee, uh, in May. And we're gonna put it up on their website so that all of you can hold us accountable for that. Um, the different engagement opportunities that we're gonna have, of course, we, we have lots of different things going on here. We're gonna have plenty of uh, public surveys on Engage Milwaukee. We do monthly updates at PARD meetings, but the big opportunities are for Scott Park. We're gonna have a big celebration on um, Sunday, May 1st from 1030 to 1230, which I'll talk about. We then have a public workshop in July. And then either in September or October, we're gonna have another public meeting. Bowman Bray and Belfour uh, have existing plans that have already been through planning commission and, and city council, but we're gonna work to refine those at uh, public meetings uh, or workshops in July. There'll be another opportunity to take a look at those plans in October. Those will be um, two separate meetings for each park um, uh, uh, at, in both July and October. And then the final plans we'll share with all of you in November and then bring to city council in December. So I mentioned uh, Scott Park. Um, so you all should have received a postcard in the mail. Um, and we are having a celebration at Scott Park on May 1st, right behind the Letting Library. We're gonna take a look at the existing conditions. We're gonna look at the project constraints. And we're gonna talk about your different preferences for amenities. These are gonna be interactive stations uh, that you can work with us and have informal conversations, but then also, you know, have some fun by writing on boards and putting sticky notes on boards and dots on boards. But we're also going to have a celebration, right? We're going to have a, a food truck or a tuck, as it says on my presentation. <laughs> um, we're going to have uh, lots of family games. Uh, we've actually developed a uh, coloring book page that looks a lot like Scott Park and bought a whole bunch of crayons for kids to develop their own site plan for Scott Park. And then we've got a, a bunch of uh, performers and entertainment uh, lined up to go on while this is going on. This is an informal event. Uh, and the design, the reason why we're doing it this way is because we want to make sure that we start this project out with a fun opportunity that is informal. 
because what we've heard from uh, the equity steering committee and PARB members is that government is often very difficult to get involved in, particularly if you're a new voice, right? Particularly if you're somebody who hasn't always been invited to the table, or maybe unfortunately in the past were dissuaded from being a part of the conversation, right? And so what are those barriers that have been identified, right? We know that people are very busy, right? And often getting involved in a meeting like this is very difficult, right? And it's kind of intimidating. So if it's informal and we have an opportunity to build a relationship with people, then we can invite them to other meetings along the way. And it's not so intimidating, right? We're going to make sure that we provide food um, so that people don't have to worry about, hey, how do I feed my kids, right? Maybe you're a single parent. Maybe you're juggling multiple jobs, right? And uh, giving up your time is pretty difficult for a presentation, but if we have a celebration that's a lot of fun during the farmer's market, the first one of the year that a lot of people are already going to, it's a lot easier to get involved. Um, so we're having food. You don't have to worry about childcare because you can bring your kids along. And then in the future meetings, we will make sure that we provide that food and childcare so that people can stay involved. And thank you for bearing with me for my very long presentation. You all should have received a couple weeks ago a postcard that looks a lot like this on one side. Uh, we really hope to see you uh, throughout this next year as we develop these uh, park plans and designs and hopefully see you Sunday, May 1st from 1030 to 1230 at the Letting Library. And with that, I will answer just about any question you got. Adam, so, uh, you got it, you got it, go. Well, uh, can you do happen to have handy uh, a map that shows where these three parks are? Uh, because you're talking to some people who haven't lived in the community that long, and some people may not know. I, um, yeah, sure. So Scott Park is right behind Letting Library. And you can almost see it from here. <laughs> you can almost see it from there. So Scott Park is, uh, depending on who you talk to, that grassy area behind the park with the park benches and lovely trees. But often, uh, but also for this project includes the amphitheater and veterans memorial uh, and small plaza area behind the library. We know that the connection between the library and Scott Park is really important. Um, and so we want to make sure that we make our beautiful brand new library and our soon to be beautiful brand new park work together because we know that those are so important to people. Uh, Belfort Park is not far from Scott Park. It's uh, in the Ardenwald neighborhood. Uh, just off of 32nd Street. And then Bowman Bray Park is in the Lake Road neighborhood um, down off of Freeman Street and, and Lake Road. And Adam, I'm going to, if I may, uh, take the screen sharing back for just a moment. I can, I can show folks uh, a, live, uh, a live map of that. Sure. So let me... Yeah, a couple of those parks are completely undeveloped, uh, or nearly so. So, I mean, you're, people may not even know their parks. Yeah, you know, um, so uh, Belfort and Bowman Bray Park uh, were both bought in like 2007, 2008 by the city using Metro dollars. They were former residents, and right now they are just, um, you know, vacant land. Uh, there's some uh, bollards and cable fencing there. Uh, but that's about it. Uh, Scott Park um, is slightly developed and had a master plan from 1999. But once the library was built, um, that plan became obsolete and was actually revoked. Here's Balfour. Here's Scott. Just right behind the letting library. And then also Bauman Ray, where is it hiding? Further down. A little bit further. Yep, there we go. There it is. Bauman Bray. And that's Milwaukee. I'll put in a plug for the Milwaukee Parks Foundation, which has a nice little map of all the parks in Milwaukee on a postcard that you can get and put on your refrigerator. Um, and also you can find on their website, milwaukeeparksfoundation.org. 
uh, all the parks in Milwaukee. Thanks. You can find that on the city's website as well, I think. This is imperfect. We're figuring out this hybrid thing. <laughs> Let's not all think too much about it. <laughs> <clears throat> any, any other questions for Adam? I have a question. <clears throat> The Milwaukee Bay Park, that is very near where we are, had an original plan that included a parking lot. And when you were talking about the inclusion of people, having people that we need to bring things like coolers and diapers and all that other jazz to the park, seemed like it made a whole lot of sense. But in the process where the city had their hands in it and then it got pushed off to the parks department, the plans got changed, the parking lot got cut, and you guys are planning a couple of new parks. You're talking about spending money, and from the sounds of it, it doesn't sound like you guys are broke because you're talking about just being able to get use of some COVID funding for various reasons. But I'm curious why they didn't think that was really important to include, um, because knowing that the only parking that's down there is specifically for boaters because the boating association actually was a political force when that was built so the average person can't park there except for a half a dozen spaces in front of the water treatment plant which you know two people show up and it's pretty much done so i'm curious why that got dropped and why that didn't seem like an important thing i got from Dan, a contact number in the parks, and I sent an email over voicing these concerns, and they said that they would pass that along in the meeting when they were talking about getting public involvement. But to me, it makes the most sense for, you're talking about building three different new apartment complexes, which is gonna bring people into the area, and just the fact that it's our local neighborhood park, but it has no place for people to pull in and park their car if they do have munchkins. So is there any justification why that's not an important part of a park? Because there's no street parking, obviously, on 99 and parking six blocks away and carting uh, half a car load full of stuff down there doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. Adam, yes, you want me to lead your blocking a little bit and point out that Adam's yeah. been here for like six months <laughs> and, and hasn't been hired to uh, to redesign Milwaukee Bay Park. <laughs> um, Go ahead, Adam. You got it. Yeah. So I'm, I'm sorry. I, I can't see you. So so who? Uh, what's your name? Is the, the, way, the way the camera is set up, Dave? Is I'm sorry. It's it's pointed the other way. Yeah. Sorry. I'm on the opposite side of the camera. <laughs> yeah. What What is your name? Dave. Dave, nice to meet you, Dave. Um, nice to so, meet you yeah, too. Yeah, so um, Milwaukee Bay Park right now is being uh, designed and developed by North Clackamas Parks and Rec. Uh, the city is uh, involved in this, but right now that is being led by North Clackamas Parks and Rec. They had a meeting uh, on Monday night that was recorded, and they discussed a lot the challenges of the site, uh, a lot of which you mentioned. And I think that, you know, given that I've only been at the city for six months and that my focus is on Bowman, Bray, Belfort and Scott parks only, I really can't dive into uh, that topic because I, I wasn't here. And that's that's really not not the focus of of my work. But I do know that the engagement process for the current design for NCPR or for Milwaukee Bay Park is going on right now at NCPRD uh, is asking people to to comment on that design right now. I, I don't mean to like skirt the question, but uh, that really isn't the focus of my work or, or something that I'm really involved in. Can I jump in on that question? <laughs> Go ahead. Certainly. I, I would say we we're, were running we're out of time. Over time yeah. So if, but please, and, and we'll maybe wrap it. Okay. Yes. I, if you watch, I would encourage, as Adam said, to watch the um, go to NCPRD's website, ncprd.com, and watch the tape for Monday. They are looking to put in more of a drop-off area at that edge of the parking lot where the, you know, the curve is where the boats go now to create more of a sort of a drop-off area for people to drop things. I would not look for more parking. I do not think there will be more parking. And that was a 
compromise reached about 15 years ago between the boaters and the people. There were people who wanted no boat ramp, who wanted no boat ramp and wanted it all to be green space. There were people who liked what it was before, which was all a large parking lot with hardly any green space. Um, so what you see now, which was built in 2014, 2015, was sort of a compromise that was reached by the river, what was called at the point, at that point, the Riverfront Board. Um, and uh, I think, you know, parking downtown is going to be, the, and there are more, there are actually in that presentation, there are an equal number of boat trailer and non-trailer parking. There are actually an equal number if you count the ones up by the sewage plant. Um, but I know it's frustrating for the people who don't have, and it's frustrating for the boat trailers too. Boat trailers come park in my neighborhood. The boat trailers park in historic Milwaukee up Washington Street. The boat trailers, you know, they also overflow the park. So it's frustrating for both kinds of users that there's not enough parking, uh, but I would not expect that to change. Um, thank you. I realize that you don't have, obviously, the information because you are new. And I have seen the original plan that they showed with the boating and also the revised one that included a parking lot right off of McLaughlin, which was enough for extra spaces because that's one of those shell games where you say they have equal amount of spaces, but anyone visiting this, the sewer plant or just trying to find a place to park eas easily fills up those spaces. So I understand, and I don't want to, you know, steal any more of your time, but thank you for answering my question. Yeah, and I, I, Dave, I would really encourage you to reach out to NCPRD. Um, the plans are, are up on their website and they have comment forms available for them. They are the lead on the project and they are uh, responsible for, for this design and development of the park right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Adam. Yeah. Thank you very much, Adam. Thanks for being here. And again, folks, let me just go ahead and plug one more time. May 1st, Scott Park, be there. Be a person in a goose suit, something to look forward to. <laughs> Thanks so much, Adam. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so with that, I am gonna go ahead and drag this back over and we are going to move on through all of that very, very quickly to okay. our library presentation with our library director, Katie Noel. Katie? I have to stand up. I've been sitting all day. <laughs> when they gave me the opportunity to have a podium, I want to go. Yes, I so want this. And are you too okay if I don't wear my mask? Okay, thank you. I wear it all the time, but if I talk, y'all will be able to hear me, which is kind of a miracle. Um, thank you all. Oh, I'm Katie. Uh, we're good with the library, and um, that's where that new park's going to be going. Uh, I mean, a park is there now. They're going to um, have a big event on May 1st. Um, we're helping with it and everything, so I hope everybody's able to come during the day. Uh, come in the morning. Uh, I think it's going to be over by like uh, 12 30, 1 o'clock. The library opens at 12. It's got, I mean, the uh, farmer's market opens at 10, I mean, uh, 9 30. So, it's kind of a busy Monday for us. Um, so I'm here to talk about the library. Ooh. I'm so sorry, Katie. That, there you go. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> when I did this uh, two years ago, we had just opened. So I don't know who all has been here for many years, but we just opened the library on uh, January 11th to our big opening. And two months later, we were closed. Mm -hmm. um, and we had been waiting for a very long time for that new library, but it, it was okay. Um, and and so, Stefan, we, we did it at the library uh, two years ago, and we did a, a, a tour. And, and so I really didn't talk at all, uh, which is kind of amazing because I tend to. So I will make a very short story long, but I will try to keep it under because I don't like sitting around too long. So um, I just wanted to go over like, we're a city department. We are uh, one of the bigger ones. We have 23 people in work in the library, and that's our regular people. We also have some on-call people. Um, I had to write this down because I couldn't remember how many we had. I believe 16 um, on-calls that help us with subs because people get sick. We don't have enough staff <laughs> to keep things running, and you know people take a vacation. 
can't believe that, but you know, <laughs> they, they think they are allowed to. So we have to have subs to help us. We have um, LA twos, no, LA ones. Those are our CERC people. Those are the most of our uh, on calls. And then we also have librarians. Uh, the LA twos are our medium people. They do all the processing of books, but if they're out, they're out. But if uh, one of the librarians are out, oh, then we don't have anybody to do reference or we don't have anybody to help with the computers. So we always have to have a life, um, somebody, a librarian to help out. And again, if the circulation people aren't there, oh, then we can't check out books, we can't help them find things, we can't show. There's so many things that we can't get done. So we always have to have um, subs for those two, two, two categories. We have a library director, that's me. And then there's uh, the children's supervisor. And if you've been over to the library at all, you know Jana. And we have the circulation uh, supervisor. And then underneath, that's where um, the children's has two librarians and an LA1, I mean, an LA2. And the circulation person has the 12 LA1s that she's over. And then I have three people, um, adult reference and an LA2, and they kind of just fell under me because there was no one else to take them on. So, um, and we're open seven days a week, which uh, is fine for us. This is what we've always been doing. It kind of gets um, on days that the city is closed on a Monday because the holiday falls on a Sunday. We're closed on Sunday. And then the city's closed on Monday. And we're like the only ones here, you know, but yeah, it's okay. Uh, we're used to it, but, but it's, it's kind of funny. We, we take a day later off or something, but um, but we get that Sunday off, which we usually don't. So we kind of like having the Sundays off. Uh, we work um, 62 hours a week that we're open. And then we have another 22 hours that we work behind the scenes, getting things ready every day for the library. Um, oh, good, I can click over that one. I usually don't even do notes. Um, so the 20 hours, 22 hours that we are not open, these are things that we spend um, you know, checking in books from the book drop. We also have to get these all checked in from the crates that come from other libraries to do the holds that come from other libraries. We have to get all those done before we open at 10. So that's our like number one goal, getting all of those things done. Then we have the pick list of people who put things on holds. Then we have to pull those and put them back in the crates and get them ready for the people to take back out. And so that goes on throughout the day. Uh, then we answer emails, which everybody does. Uh, we order new materials. We repair, mend new um, books that get broken, or you know, we try to redo um, DVDs. You know, run them through and have them clean, see if we can, you know, get them to work a couple more times before we have to get a new one or throw it away. We that's when we get to plan our programs and you know, contact our performers and do the scheduling. And we get to attend meetings <laughs> all the time, um, citywide, district-wide, and we try to have a staff one once a month if we can. Um, it's kind of hard to, we have people working all different hours because every day, everybody works a night, everybody works a weekend. And so any given morning, no one's there. And we try to do it before we open. And, and so, Zoom has been very friendly to us because we've been actually able to get people to come in if they want to uh, during our morning meetings. So, um, and then we schedule uh, building maintenance. Again, we try to get that done before we open. And our facilities people are great. They usually come like at six o'clock in the morning and we're not there yet. So it's, they get everything done before we get there. Um, on a daily basis, we probably check out about uh, 1,700 items, um, as well as check in that many from people returning. Uh, I always try to see which one's higher. Some days, you know, we, we check out more. Some days we check out, we check in more. But um, it, it's it's pretty even. Usually about 200 between the difference, and that's it. So. Um, 
We've been averaging 475 patrons um, a day coming in, which is great for us. It's not as many as we were when we very first opened in the new library, but that was because we had like 2,000 the first day. But that was, <laughs> that died down. <laughs> no. But we had a lot of people show up for when we had our first grand opening. And we've been having about 60 computer signups every day. So people are using the library. Uh, it, it's every month you can see, you know, it's like, oh, wow, we just got 40 more people doing this. Oh, we got this. So uh, we opened July 1st to our regular hours again, having evening hours and weekends. And people are, are still waiting, but most everybody's coming back. Um, we're about half and half of people wearing masks. Staff, I let them choose if they want to or not. Uh, we don't make anybody wear a mask, but there's still a lot of people that are, and uh, they feel comfortable wearing one. So that's, I'm, I'm happy about. They should be able to do whatever they want on those. Um, and we haven't started our formal program, in-person programs yet. We're going to be doing that in the fall, so we're going to be working on that all summer, getting some adult uh, teen programs. The children's will be meeting out in the, the parks again, um, outside. They did that for the past two years, and they're, they're going to be doing Mondays and Tuesday, 1030 story times, and then once, uh, that's in July, August, no, June, July, and August, and then in July and August, they're also going to be having the free summer lunches um, that the North Clackamas counties provide, the, the school district provides us, and we'll have a, um, a program at 1030, and then the lunch will be from 1130 to 12, and that will be on Thursdays in July and August. So bring kids over, we don't care who comes, we want them all to come. Um, and they all, they all have a good time. Um, the, the poetry series, and the um, Letting Lecture series that was partnered with the Milwaukee Historical Society, those kept on. Uh, we were able to do those through Zoom for the entire pandemic. So we were happy that those kept on. We wish we could have done a little bit more, but we, I don't know. We did a lot of things online. A lot of things were, some things were really popular, some things weren't. We added some databases to get people to do like creative bug and do some, um, things at home, we were added uh, the New York Times um, newspaper, so people could read that, not because we have it available for people to come in and read. So we tried to get everybody to um, kind of get keep semi-normal while we were in those abnormal times. Um, and we're going to have two uh, team programs this summer. Uh, we're working on, there's going to be one in July and one in August, and we're going to try to get some interest in a teen advisory board. And it's one of these things that we've been trying for years to get together. And then, I mean, I don't know if who all was have been here for the whole time, but you know, we were open in, at the old library over there. And then we uh, got a bond, we passed the bond, and we decided we were gonna build there. So, you know, we, we were always gonna build there um, because the history which I'll explain in just a moment. But, we um, moved to a pod down the road, and it was in a TriMet lot just mm -hmm. down the road, and it was this big um, trailer mm -hmm. that we were in. But it was really nice inside. We got to still do people coming in. We couldn't do programs because it really was just not big enough. But it, we still ran our library, and then we moved back here. And you know, as I said, we had the pandemic. So, but now, now we're, we're, we're back up to normal. And that is really good. Um, and I just kind of, the purpose of the library, uh, we have a mission statement uh, separate from the cities. It kind of goes with the cities, but um, you know, our, our mission is to uphold the principles of intellectual freedom and the public's right to know by providing people of all ages access and personalized guidance to information, technology, and collections that reflect all points of view. The library supports the pursuit of education and personal goals by providing informational, recreational, and cultural materials and services, including those utilizing and advancing technologies. It's kind of lofty, but that's what we try to do. Um, we 
all feel very strongly about giving to everybody what the you know an ability to come in and use a computer if you can't find one at home. Um, and I tell you what, what's been really nice is all these people are coming in with their laptops now, and but they have a, a place that they can plug in because oh, with a new library we got a whole bunch of outlets, so people can come in and um, use their laptops. So that's worked out really really well. Um, we try to serve the community. We, we, we love input from the community. And um, only when it's good, though. Um, <laughs> no, we, 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 we actually want to know what we're doing wrong, what we're doing right, what would you want more of. And uh, it's been a long time since we've been able to get that information from anybody. So, so now, you know, if you're by the library, just put a little, you know, like, hey, we would like to see this. And um, anything that we can do, we try to do. And uh, it, it, that's kind of like the fun part of our jobs is that we get to you know, do things for people. So uh, that's why we all like it. And I don't know how many of you know the history of Florence Letting and how we became the Letting Library, but I really love this woman. Yeah, she's, she's been gone like 50, oh, oh wow, 70 years, it's a long time. But she uh, was born in 1870 and, you know, moved here with her mom when she's like six years old and she settled in milwaukee and her mom got uh you know married and she just settled here she went to oregon um and went to law school now so this is like in the early 1900s she's going to law school and i just felt that that was so amazing because well i'm sorry women didn't get to do that kind of stuff and she was the uh, one of the first female attorneys in Oregon. She was the first female referee for bankruptcy proceedings in the whole Oregon U.S. District Court. And she loved Milwaukee. That was she just loved this place. And her husband did too. He was a, he was a counsel even one time at some point. But she um, always just felt committed to this city and they they you know they, they developed schools they they worked with the library they helped the downtown businesses they did anything they could to make this city be its own they, they didn't want to be part of portland they didn't want to be part of oregon city they wanted to be milwaukee and um so when she was getting older um, and being the very smart lawyer that she was, she left her house and her land to the city of Milwaukee ever and ever and ever, as long as it was maintained as a library. So they could not have a library there, but then they had to sell the, they didn't get to keep the land. So, we get to be a library forever. And I, I just love that this woman did this. And, and she did it in such a way that nobody can change the will. It's, it's done. So, um, and that's why we are right over there. And so, and that's why we're called the Letting Library. And if you happen to walk in, you see this picture that we have up with this uh, woman, and that's Florence Letting. And we used to have a picture of her when she had like a, a floofy hat and she just looked old. And, and I was like, no, oh, no, no. This was this vibrant woman that just did all this stuff her whole life. I don't want her to be some old fuddy duddy, you know? So, and so we had this um, wonderful artist draw this beautiful, and, and she looks like she's almost, you know, like for, well, it was her debutante picture. And, and yet it shows what she did here and in Milwaukee. So I'm really very proud of her. So that's me in the library. If there are any questions, feel free to ask. Come by. We love company. Um, we always tell people to buy and see us. So. Amy, what can you tell us about the magazine? Or <gasps> oh my gosh, I completely forgot. <laughs> we won a big award. Okay, it was not really me uh, or my library, but it was our library. It was for the architect. Um, they, they design this every year. The uh, Library Journal uh, does the November issue is with it's all about the different um, architectural ways of going through what's going on in the libraries. And 
they put us on the cover, which was a huge honor. And then when you open it up, there's there's like a little piece on it. And it just talks about how sustainable we were built, how we have um, the um, the solar panels and we have the, you know, the, the floors that are, you know, the radiant cooling and heating. And, um, and, and so it kind of gave us and it says, oh, a front runner. And I said, oh, yeah, that's us. <laughs> so um, yeah, it was, it was very, really exciting for us. So that, that's why I included on everything uh, right now, because I can brag about it. Um, I think it's going to be on the budget. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, let's just use this one in the budget for the library. So um, yeah, I, I kind of like that picture. So uh, it's in the back, though, so you really don't see it. You have to really get out in the weeds to, yeah, to see yeah, that yeah, particular yeah. perspective. Yeah, yeah, it, is, it, it is in the back. But uh, it's a great picture. Don't don't let that stop you though. That library looks great inside as well. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Does anybody have um, have questions for Katie? Questions about the library? Questions about Florence Letting? I see a line. <laughs> yes. I'm curious. Um, just out of my own personal interest, I do some work with adult English language learners, and I'm curious. Some libraries have programs for adult English language learners. Is that ever a demand that you've seen or expressed? We have not, but that doesn't mean that there isn't one. Mm -hmm. You know, so many times people just go elsewhere because it already exists. Um, when I was at uh, a library before, I I did this on the East Coast too. So when I was back there, um, we had a class for um, English, well, English as a second language. Um, we did a class for people to earn their um, GED and do all the testing and everything on our computers before we opened up in the morning. Oh, okay. And so it worked great. And we just don't have the, I haven't found that type of relationship yet with, because it was a group paid for all of the testing and all of the materials so i need to find that that we can but if you you know know of anybody or something um that would be great okay all right i'll, I'll keep that yeah. in mind so my name is katie i'm at the i'm the only katie at the library <laughs> <laughs> no one's allowed to <laughs> i don't think Thank you mentioned you. library of things yeah exactly. we have library of things we have the seed library um so like if i i'm like death to plants but they keep on trying to get me but but you can go and try um you for little seeds they have these little packets and you can take people donate you can buy some and you go and you can plant them at home and then we also have uh, the library of things where you're going to lease out rent out for two weeks um it could be right now we have a lot of different things it could be a puzzle it could be a rake it's a shovel i had someone just yesterday asking me um is your shovel the kind with the pointed edge so i went and took a picture of the center said yeah this is our puzzle i mean this is our shovel so um you know we have so many things we have um oh what are those things the insta books oh the, the the cook thing you know where you know it's does it i don't have one um but they have all these different kinds um i mean they have a sewing machine that if you just you know what i just have to hem this you just come in you buy it for two weeks and then you bring it back uh, we, we we bought a lot of things that people might want to try that you just don't know if you want. You don't want to go and spend, you know, fifty hundred dollars on something and then you find out you use it one time, you never use it again. So you come, you use it for two weeks. So you use this and go buy one. Yeah. So and we have over 200 items in that now. So that's that's been very popular as well. But a really thank cool you, Lisa. Yeah. But, I said, there's a lot of really cool stuff in there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. For folks who haven't been to the library, let me just say, go to the library. There's no, there's no second layer to that. Just go to the library. It's great there. <laughs> You'll enjoy it. Yes. Yeah, we have that problem of parking too that you know downtown Milwaukee has. But people have been really good about 
not parking their car all day. You know, they'll come in, they might come in for two hours to work on the computer or something, but then they leave. And so you can almost always find parking of some sort. And right here is also, there's always parking, so it's not too far to go. Yes. I just want to say everyone should come on May 1st to Scott Park because the Friends of the Library is having a sale yes. there in the library. If the weather's nice, you guys are going to provide like lawn games and it's going to be fun. Come on. Yeah, the thing on, on, on the first is going to be fun. The, the Friends are going to have their book sale up there. And, you know, Adam wasn't completely honest with you, <laughs> but I know. Um, you have to go look at the three different spots to get the ticket to go to the food carts. <laughs> but once you go, once you go, you're going to want to, you know, you're going to have your kids with you and you just go and you have three spots that the planning people are going to be talking about different ideas and trying to get your ideas of what you would like to have in that kind of work. Um, so I think this is a great opportunity to make this. You don't want it to be like just horribly big or anything, but just beautiful. Uh, the one that they did, what, Wichita? Was that? Wichita. I used to go there and help out on um, uh, the, their cleanup there. You had a day that the, kid, the families would go. And, and it was just like, it was horrible. It, it was just dirt. And, it was a vacant lot. Yeah, it, it basically, it, that's it. It was a big, there was a tree, one tree, like way over. And then um, I hadn't gone, and then I went there. I was just like, this, this is that park, it, and they had completely redone it, and it just looks beautiful. Um, and so I really hope that they're, you know, I mean, the park is not ugly, but it's, it's not much there. So we want to make it a little bit more inviting to people to come and stop by and then stop by the library as well. <laughs> so. I think we have time for one more question if anybody wants to close us out. I think they're all done. Last chance year. for the year. <laughs> oh, wow, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Is this your last one? This is our last yeah. one. You're our last presenter. Oh, well, then what other questions might you have for Dan? <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> Now, pray tell, how are we going to move forward with this? They've already seen the, the goose head, so I mean, all my secrets are... No, <laughs> you, you mean the Leadership Academy? Yeah. Yeah, so next year, the Milwaukee Leadership Academy, uh, as I understand it, is going to be coming back. I think that's the plan. Um, Stefan has uh, graciously agreed to come back and, and keep me on track next year, which I really appreciate. God, it's hard to. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I think I, this is this is one of my very favorite things that we do as an organization. I mean, I said that at the start of it. Um, and thank you, Katie, for this opportunity to yeah. speak. Um, I get I get choked up when I think about people taking time out of their lives, uh, as busy as we all are, to come here uh, month in and month out and learn about how their local government works, because there is this notion that we're stronger together and that it does actually matter and that we can make a difference in the world if we work together on it. And thank you. Thank you all for being here. We'll do it again uh, October. If anybody wants to come for round two, just to turn on your forms and we'll get you. So, so let, me, let me toss in my, my pitch, yeah. which is the one I started the class with, and I always start, start this, is that you are shareholders in this huge corporation that's worth billions of dollars. And the library is one of the things you own. And you should be proud of it and see it as yours. That's a strategically placed beam for those yeah, folks on Zoom. And I really, directly. really do hope somebody here runs for office. Yeah, don't we, Lisa, is someone terming out? Are you terming out this year? <laughs> <laughs> the mayor's terming out. And yeah, terming. so we, we have some openings here. We, we Term need limits. That, someone that's going to continue on this, the, the way this council has worked for you know, the last several years. Um, it's, it's not always the same. Some people come and go, but the, the, the inner feeling of being able to accomplish something, 
This, this, that's just been fantastic. As, as an employee, it's been wonderful to see. So I really encourage somebody here to step forward. It's, it, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Forget the 470. Three uh, uh, pages. <laughs> Don't mind about those packets. Sometimes, sometimes they're much shorter. Sometimes it's only hundred. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's only on a. I, I think that might be that's one day. Yeah. <laughs> I think that might be kind of it, uh, Mr. Lashbrook. You got any uh, aha moments for the for the room? Would you like to like to take us out? No, no. I guess I, I was really glad to have two city councilors here tonight. And I thought that the, that in general, this uh, the leadership academy could benefit from more involvement from the council, just because it's, it's an interactive thing, and people are astonished to hear people who move here from a bigger city, especially. You mean I could call Councillor Beatty and talk about what's going on? I could send her an email. Wow. Send me an email. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, so. They're getting them more involved. I think that's that's what I want to see going forward. We'll see. It looks like we do have a couple of hands from the from the uh, some some ahas coming. Uh -huh. uh, Crystal, would you like to start, and then uh, uh, Richard, you can follow on. Thanks. Um, first of all, I just want to say that I am so extremely disappointed that I'm not there in person tonight. I was so looking forward to this. I tested positive for COVID three days ago, and so I oh, felt like. Nice. My responsibility not to go give it to everyone. So, but I'm really, really sad because I I am so grateful for this leadership academy. But I hate Zoom, and I was so excited about being in person. So, um, I actually just wanted to say that my aha is this whole academy was so organized and thoughtful. And Daniel were talking about people who are taking time out of their lives and their work day to do this, but it's really clear that even though this is part of your job, this is something you care about and you put in a lot of effort above and beyond to make this a really incredible experience for everyone. And I just wanted to thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Richard, it's my turn. Um, well, I, I'm also grateful that I got to attend this. Uh, it, it's been wonderful to learn about Milwaukee because when I, when, I when I moved to Oak Grove, of course, I thought I moved to Milwaukee. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and the only question I think that you haven't answered for me is why is Milwaukee spelled with an IE at the end? But, <laughs> have, have we not talked about that? What, why is, I missed the question. I oh, why, why is I, Milwaukee spelled with an IE at the end? Oh, so it could be differentiated from that great big Milwaukee. Where no one would want to live, <laughs> or, or as we think of it in the city, the other Milwaukee. Yeah. Yeah, My family in Wisconsin thinks it's hysterical. So, yeah. <laughs> I was born in a town in New Jersey called Califon, that shortened its name from California because it didn't want to get confused with it. State out west, there were seven hundred people in it in uh, nineteen fifty. <laughs> um, but. Beyond that, I, I put a note in the chat, but I understand most of you don't have a computer in front of you, so you don't see it. Uh, in terms of getting involved, and I, and I also understand there's plenty of room for involvement in Milwaukee proper, the Citizens for Community Involvement, which is a advisory group to the Board of Com County Commissioners for Clackamas, has an opening. Uh, their, their business is to, uh, help the, the county commissioners get involved, understand what's going on in the city and to bring items forward to the commissioners that are of concern to people uh, in the county. It's a tremendously large county and I'm in Oak Grove. Uh, I am the only one on the 11 member commission that is from a urban area or a suburban area. Um, so if somebody from Milwaukee wanted to join, um, we might have a better way of getting uh, some equity in that most people get elected by the people who don't live in the urban suburban areas. Uh, the middle housing is going to be a big issue that affects us more than the, than the uh, uh, rural areas, but the rural areas are going to have the votes that control how it goes in the county. 
So if Dan, if you want to share that, it's in the, the notes, the, uh, uh, the, the place where you can find the CCI link I, for the county. Yeah, thank you very much, Richard. I see it there. And then uh, Kevin also shared uh, shared some some useful links as well. So I'm making note of those and I will get those out in um, in, in the follow on email after this. Okay, and I do look forward to part two someday. There you go. Um, Richard, I'll look forward to meeting you in person one of these days. <laughs> well, you know, if you meet me in person at this point, you won't recognize me because I'll have a mask over my face. <laughs> 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 but but I'll still have a ponytail, so I'll look somewhat oh, like that's you. That's hideous. <laughs> hey, you walk around like that? <laughs> I, no, I just screwed that this week. <laughs> Hair extensions. Alrighty. Well, folks, I think um, are we? There? I think we're done. I think we're done. Well, I, hey, everybody, again, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you to all of our presenters, for all of the staff members who took the time to come in, for our council members who have joined us, not just tonight, but also at the beginning. Um, and, and as always, to uh, Mr. Stephen Lashbrook, my, uh, my, my partner Your bodyguard. Class, my bodyguard, <laughs> something like that. Thank you all. Be safe, be well. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. And if anybody wants to go to Cha Cha Cha,